Hey, thank you again. Uh, let's uh, give ben, uh, ben Fish, uh, along with uh, joint work with Benedict uh, Buns and uh, Dan Bona, a hand for uh, authenticated data structures for blockchain consensus with minimal storage. Thanks, uh, Brandon. Uh, okay, so let's see. Is, this is the clicker. Uh, green. Hmm? Got it. No, that's the, yeah, the green arrow. The green arrow, perfect. So, okay. Uh, blockchains are transactional databases. So, naturally, as with any transactional database, they grow in size with use. Um, but the significant thing about you know blockchains like Bitcoin or Monero is that they're supposed to be decentralized in their maintenance. So they aim to have many, many uh, participants called miners all be able to verify transactions that update the database. And um, as the size of the database grows, then the, the size, the amount of storage that, that um, all the participants in the system need to maintain in order to verify transactions grows as well, and if it grows to be too large, to some degree, it inhibits the goals of decentralization because we want to make it as easy as possible for anyone to be able to participate in consensus, not necessarily using a tremendous amount of storage. You could imagine a future where even like, a, you know, a, a smartwatch or something very, with very, very little memory should still be able to participate in verification um, of the entire blockchain, right? So let's start with a very simplified view of uh, what blockchain consensus looks like in order to explain um, what I'll call the difference between stateful consensus versus stateless consensus, which will have um, involve minimal storage among the, the, the miners participating in consensus. So in stateful consensus, transactions come in and miners all listen to the transactions, they all append the transactions to their log, and so everybody is storing a copy of this database. Now, of course, that could be great because uh, highly, high replication is a good thing for fault tolerance, but um, you might not want to design a system where every single person participating in consensus absolutely needs to replicate the entire you know, log of transactions. So uh, the question is, um, you know, what can we do to, to first of all, so how do these, how do we, how do we handle uh, miners comparing that they are all talking about the same database without um, sending the entire database to, e to each other? Well, we know that's easy, right? We just could compute a hash of the database and compare efficiently. Now that's not actually how it's done because we also want, uh, and this is a little of a form of stateless verification, we want a, a miner who, uh, you know, to, who is not storing the entire transaction log and able to compute a big hash over everything to uh, be able to just store um, what's called the state head and be able to immediately verify that every other miner in the system is still talking about the same database Let's say this miner is only listening to transactions as they happen, not storing the whole database. How can that miner verify everyone else is still talking about the same database? Well, we just define the hash in a way that can be computed in a streaming way, and that's, um, and that's like this, where the hash gets updated by hashing in the previous hash head with the new update, and that's where we get our, um, you know, our blockchain. So, what happens now when we add rules to this database? Well, then somebody who's just listening to the system, well, maybe they can verify that everybody else still agrees about the same sequence of updates, all the same, the same transaction log. But certainly this miner who's participating in the system with no storage has no way of verifying that new transactions coming in are actually correct or not, right? For example, one rule is, well, this new transaction spends the same coin that a previous transaction spent, so that transaction should be rejected. But this miner with no storage has no way of knowing this. So 
What we would like from stateless verification is the ability of a miner with very, very, very small compact storage, like just storing a little hash representation of everything that's happened so far, would be able to, you know, listen to transactions coming in and say, oh, this should be rejected, or oh, this should be accepted. So how could we possibly do that? How could we possibly define these compact hashes in a way that, you know, all the nodes can just store this hash and still be able to check the validity of transactions? Well, clearly we need something additional, okay? Some kind of additional proof that will be sent along with transactions. So we'll make the transaction slightly more complicated. But what I'm going to talk about is, well, how is that proof generated? How efficient is it? Uh, and who generates the proof, first of all? But to take a, a step back, just from a, maybe a philosophical perspective or a, you know, a, a more abstract view, what we're calling for is a separation between the consensus layer of the blockchain and the, the state storage of the blockchain. And both of these we want to be decentralized or distributed and fault tolerant, but we can really look at them as two different systems. And one which aims to you know, maintain the, and store all the data in the blockchain and, um, and be able to provide basically proofs and state updates to the consensus, which is really not focused on, uh, on uh, necessarily providing, um, you know, um, a really high performance database, but rather just being able to participate in agreement and, and verify that things look good. Uh, so let's focus on a concrete now, like specific, uh, example of, of, of a blockchain model, and so I'll focus on UTXOs, as since it's relevant to uh, both Bitcoin and Monero. So, what are UTXOs? Uh, if, in case, you know, just as a reminder, whatever, uh, every transaction consumes inputs. Think of like coins assigned to addresses that are the inputs and transactions. Every transaction creates outputs. Coins are reassigned to new addresses. And UTXOs are simply the transaction outputs that have not been consumed yet. So they can still be spent, they're still valid inputs to new transactions. And that's really what the miners, all the miners really need to agree on. What are the set of records which are still valid? And that's all you really need to know in order to be able to verify the correctness of, uh, of a transaction, aside from other things that don't depend on the state of the database, like the transaction is well formatted. So uh, this small compact hash thing that I was talking about, it's going to be some kind of commitment to the, uh, to the UTXO set. And we'll talk about how to update that commitment dynamically and how to, and, and how to verify proofs that, um, that something is in this set or not. And the general cryptographic technique uh, that is needed for this is called an accumulator. Uh, we all know. Um, a, or m maybe some of us know of like the most popular example of an accumulator, which is a Merkle tree, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. And this kind of work is about doing things that are better than Merkle trees for this, uh, for this task. But abstractly, what the accumulator does is it allows you to give a short proof that, say, all the UTXOs in the transaction are actually part of the UTXO set. Um, okay, so let's say we have this kind of simplified, um, you know, picture of, of a blockchain. Then the proposal for these UTXO commitments, which was uh, which was actually you know proposed uh, a considerable time ago, um, was to say, okay, well, let's say every every block can basically keep track of consensus can keep track of what is this like small hash commitment basically to you know, all the, all the UTXOs. And so let's just imagine that we have a way to do that. We'll talk about in a lot more detail how that can possibly be done. But let's say consensus is able to keep track of a, uh, this accumulator hash um, that represents, with, you know, very, very little uh, storage, the UTXO set. And then it's possible to be able to prove that something is in there. So one way to do that is to use a Merkle tree where this um, the UTXO commitment is simply the root of a Merkle tree over all the UTXOs. And the transactions would then 
um, basically provide inclusion proofs, uh, which can be done with a, a login size path up the Merkle tree. And, um, and so every transaction would basically include a Merkle proof that the referenced UTXO in the transaction is inside this Merkle tree. And miners would say, OK, this looks good. But they don't actually need to store the whole UTXO set. Um, so stepping back and looking more broadly at accumulators, um, so accumulators, well, like what we didn't talk about with that Merkle tree example was also, you know, how do, how do things get added to the accumulator? How do things get added to the Merkle tree? Can, can, can we do that in a distributed way so that um, people who are not storing the entire state of the accumulator and they see a new transaction can all simultaneously update the accumulator to get a new state? So update the root of the Merkle tree you can think of. Um, so uh, Merkle trees are examples of accumulators. There's also RSA accumulators, which um, is the basis of the work that I'm going to present in this talk. And there's other types of accumulators. They all achieve different kinds of trade-offs. One nice thing about RSA accumulators and, um, and these pairing-based accumulators are that uh, the, the size of the proof is constant size as opposed to log size, which the Merkle trees have. Uh, so let's say we were using Merkle tree witnesses for this, um, you know, <coughs> for for uh, for, for uh, if, you know, let's say we were using Merkle tree witnesses for uh, these transaction proofs. Well, then, let's say that we had a hundred million UTXOs. Every Merkle tree witness, you know, while one witness doesn't seem that large, they. Together, they get to be quite large, right? And so it would require about 800 bytes per UTXO. And so that's a lot of extra storage to keep around. So even though we've reduced the storage of the miners in the system, who now only need to store the root of this Merkle tree, every transaction is going to have this, this, uh, this, this Merkle tree proof. And since many transactions not only reference one UTXO, but many, many UTXOs, Whereas before, those UTXOs could just be a like 64-bit index into the miner storage that they already have, referencing something they already have. Now it has to include this large Merkle witness. So you know the communication in the system could potentially blow up by like a factor of 100. So that's not good. And the desiderata for you know our design desiderata are not only to have short membership witnesses that are efficiently updatable, et cetera, but also to be able to aggregate witnesses and even better to be able to, 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 to batch generate and to verify them um, you know, in a, I efficiently in a batch. So you can imagine a transaction that references 100 UTXOs and just have to have one short membership witness that accounts for them all. And um, or uh, miners would be able to take many different transactions and verify in a batch all the membership witnesses. So that's our goal in the in in this current work. And uh, the the starting point for our new accumulator construction that has these properties is RSA accumulators. Uh, so very briefly, what um, how does an RSA accumulator work? There's uh, there's, there is a, a trusted setup, and I'll talk later about how to do this without trusted setup. Um, but uh, the RSA accumulator um, is based on an, an RSA modulus with an unknown factorization. So n equals p times q, p and q are secret primes. Adding something to the accumulator is just taking the hash of that thing and taking the current state of the accumulator, call it AI, and raising it to the power of the hash of that element. Um, so you can think of after we add an entire set to the accumulator, what the accumulator looks like is it's G to the U. G is the initial state, just you know some generator in, in, in Zn. Um, these are numbers modulo n. And um, U would be a product of the hashes of all the elements that are in the set. Right, so adding uh, generating this accumulator commitment to the entire set amounts to multiplying the hashes of all the elements in the set together, getting basically um, 
and, and, then, and then raising g to the u. And so g to the u is just one integer modulo n. So it's just one constant size integer. And um, deleting an element from the accumulator would uh, amount to canceling out the element we want to delete from the exponent. So if we have some way of getting ai to the 1 over h of x, then we can delete from the accumulator. And we'll talk about how that could be done. Um, so what's a membership witness in this case? Well, a membership witness is supposed to prove that, you know, that your, your hash of your, um, of your element was included. Uh, and for now, I'm just going to ignore the hash and just talk about, you know, the, the element that you're, or the member, the member of the accumulator that you're trying to prove is x, and x is already the hash of the actual element that you're, you know, that's in the accumulator. So you can think of x as the hash of your, your UTXO. So um, if you can provide a to the 1 over x, namely a value pi such that pi to the x is equal to the state of the accumulator, then you've shown that x is um, in the big product in the exponent of the accumulator. Uh, and in order to prove that something is not in the accumulator, you want to show that x does not appear in this big product in the exponent. Um, in other words, x is um, co-prime, in fact, with the product of elements in the accumulator. Uh, one thing that was on the slide, but I didn't mention it verbally, was that this special hash function maps things to primes. So the output of every hash is actually a prime number. And, um, and that guarantees that if we haven't added an element to the accumulator yet, then it will be co-prime with that big exponent in the accumulator. And so then we're able to generate these um, efficient non-membership witnesses, um, which can be easily verified because of this, this trick, which finds these uh, coefficients a, b, such that a, x plus b, u is equal to 1. And that can only be done if uh, x is co-prime with u. So um, there's also other things to do, stateless updates. I won't get into that. How can we aggregate membership witnesses? We have one membership witness, pi 1, such that pi 1 to the x is equal to the accumulator state. We have pi 2, such that pi 2 to the y is equal to the accumulator state. So then we can use this thing called Shamir's trick, um, which also generates these you know, fancy coefficients a and b, such that um, you get this relation, ax plus by is equal to 1. And if we just produce the, the uh, membership witness pi um, Pi, pi 1, 2, which is pi 1 to the b times pi 2 to the a, that actually is an aggregate membership witness. And that means that all membership witnesses per transaction block can just be represented with like 3,000 bits, right? So you could have a transaction that references many, many, many UTXOs instead of having their membership proof blow up per UTXO, as with Merkle tree proofs. Um, with accumulators, we can just give one single size, uh, size membership proof. Um, cool, so that was one of our goals. And um, let's talk about deletions. So unfortunately, deleting things requires knowledge of the factorization of P and Q naively. However, and we definitely don't want to do that because nobody should know the factorization. Otherwise, you know, the system is broken. Um, but a cool thing is that you can observe that if you have the membership proof for an item, then you can actually delete the item because the state of the accumulator after deleting is simply the membership proof for that thing because you, you already had the, the 1 over x root. That was the membership witness. So if you have the membership witness and that was already generated for your UTXO, then after you spend it, then you can broadcast that and say, OK, this is the new state of the accumulator. In fact, all the miners who, who, who saw the membership witness now know the state of the accumulator without that element. Um, of course, though, transactions happen in parallel. Uh, so we would want a way of taking many, many, many membership witnesses for different items and finding a way to combine them in order to batch delete multiple items. And that's something that um, we show how to do. So that means that for this blockchain application, the miners who are listening to the system, um, and, uh, and I'll talk 
you know, give a, a better visualization of this, are able to update the state of the accumulator when uh, transactions happen to both add new transaction outputs to the UTXO set, um, which is represented by the accumulator, or delete previous now spent transaction outputs from the accumulator, all without knowing the trapdoor or any tra you know, trapdoor information. So um, what about trusted setup? We don't like trusted setup. So uh, well, one potential thing to do is uh, just choose a large unfactorable n, but that would have to be really huge. Another thing is to choose something that hasn't been broken in a long time, so like, uh, or choose some cryptographer like Ron Rivest who maybe people trust, who has a, you know, a, he claims he forgot the factorization of this one particular RSA module. Maybe you can use that. But an, another thing you can do is um, use class groups. And class groups are basically a drop-in replacement for RSA groups because they are, they're, they're a group with where the order is unknown. That's a little, if you know what that means, that's great. Um, otherwise, don't worry about it. It's just the, um, the class groups, um, you know, uh, basically have the key property that you need from RSA groups to make these accumulators secure, and uh, they're a bit more complicated to work with. Um, but we already have some open source implementations that deal with them, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so uh, the the verification of witnesses takes a long time because it does group exponentiations. Um, 2,500 exponentiations per second. So that would be pretty slow if you're trying to do a big full sync of the blockchain. Um, so what can we do to improve that? Well, we'll use this trick called a proof of exponentiation. Um, it's based on a trick that was used for these verifiable delay functions, if you've heard of them. But um, basically, it's a, it's a way of, of proving uh, efficiently that you know, x to the um, to the alpha is equal to y without having the verifier to actually do this exponentiation themselves. What the verifier ends up doing is just reducing alpha modulo some small 128-bit prime that's chosen randomly in the protocol. And so you might say, well, asymptotically, then that's the same thing. Reducing alpha mod l is asymptotically the same complexity as taking an exponentiation x to the alpha is equal to y, but in practice it's about 5,000 times faster. Um, so uh, what is the security based on? It's based on this uh, complicated thing called an adaptive root, root assumption. Uh, actually it's not that complicated. It's basically saying that if I have an element of the group, so whether RSA group or a class group, and I choose a random prime, then it's difficult for me to output a one over L root, uh, meaning something which raised to the L power gives me back that thing that I chose, W. And um, adaptive root is what's needed for this thing to be secure. We have a theorem which says that holds in generic groups. Um, nothing is actually a generic group, so that may not mean too much, but cryptographers like to do that. So, um, what does this look like now with uh, put together with the, with our, our you know basic blockchain system? Uh, blockchain has a header, transactions. It has a spend set, things that were things that are being spent. It has a new set and things that are being created, and uh, and bunch of signatures. We have a, a previous state of the accumulator, which represents the current um, unspent set. Sorry, not the spent set. The UTXO set is the unspent set. So we will. what we'll want to do is we'll want to batch delete the spent set S from the accumulator and batch add the, uh, n the new uh, set of newly created UTXOs from um, uh, into, the, into the accumulator. Uh, we also have batching for adds. I didn't talk about that, but um, it's a nice trick. And then in the end, what these two things produce are just a bunch of proofs of exponentiation. In fact, one proof of exponentiation for the entire batch delete, one proof of exponentiation for the entire batch add, and um, and this in, in, encompasses the membership witnesses as well. So what the miners end up verifying are just two proofs of exponentiation. 
which is basically just like two reductions modulo on 128-bit prime, and, um, and then verifying the signatures. So it's quite light in terms of verification on the miner. Uh, take this with a huge grain of salt, um, since uh, you know I, I mostly do things on paper. Uh, but you know, back of the envelope, Merkle trees, you can do about 100,000 adds or verifies per second. Um, add would be like adding something, adding a UTXO to the accumulator. Um, verifying would be verifying a membership witness. Um, they're about the same complexity in terms of the operations you're doing. You're, you're, you're evaluating a bunch of, of SHA-256 hashes. Um, for RSA accumulator adds, um, basically w you have to do one exponentiation per add, even with batch add. And um, you know, just just taking numbers on on my laptop, that co that comes to about like 600 per second. And um, and for verification, though, um, because of these tricks, which 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 give us this amortization, and and uh, we really each verification is just a, a, a few reductions modulo 128 bit prime. Uh, that's quite fast. So you can do about 20,000 of those per second. Um, how am I on time? Three minutes. Okay, so uh, very briefly, we can generalize this from UTXO uh, type systems to account tracking systems. So systems uh, designed more in the Ethereum style, which tracked account account balances. Uh, and what we would be using there instead of accumulators are vector commitments. Um, Merkle trees are also vector commitments, in fact, uh, but RSA accumulators are not. So for a vector co uh, a commitment, you need to be able to prove that the item is not only in the set, but it's in the set at a particular position. Um, and, that, and, and for a key value store, what you need is actually a very a sparse vector commitment. So you need to be able to prove that you know, the, the vector at, at this position keyed by this value, which is a very, very long vector, is equal to this particular value. Um, and then you would do all the same kind of tricks. You, you have a way of proving that something um, at a particular um, keyed index of the of the key value store is equal to some balance B1 and something is equal to B2 and then you can locally verify the rest of the transaction. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, uh, you could use Merkle trees but they have kind of the same issues we talked about before. Um, there's other previous things that were constructed for, for vector commitments but they have extremely large um, setup parameters, and so in fact, for the for the key value store, it would just be con totally infeasible, um, because y you basically have to have um, setup parameters that are linear in the length of the vector. So what we do is we have build something that has constant size, common parameters, and still retains these short, um, you know, proofs that something is a certain value at a particular index. And we can do that just by using the same uh, accumulator uh, tricks we used. Uh, just basically, we start with a bit vector, and we represent each bit as you know it's one or zero, so it's either in the accumulator or not. And because we have these batching and, uh, techniques, we can prove a whole bunch of bits at once in one single constant size proof. And so that like immediately gives us these constant um, you know openings for vector commitments with basically no large setup parameters uh, because the RSA accumulator didn't have any large setup parameters. Um, so takeaway points, shifting work from miners to users, we put a little bit more burden on the users to um, keep track of membership witnesses. Um, it's a whole big debate whether that's reasonable to ask users to do or not. Um, but you could imagine also um, services which, you know, and uh, many, you know, distributed competing services which, uh, which, which, which do this for users. So you could also think of this as basically a more load balanced, you know, um, diverse sort of uh, system of, of, uh, of participants who are playing different roles for the system. So ones that are participating in consensus, ones that are storing the state in a load balance distributed way, um, being able to provide membership witnesses to users, then, which then gets you know, passed off to the consensus layer, which can really involve anyone running on any kind of, uh, any kind of um, you know, setup. So that is all I have to talk about today. Uh, a bunch of references, and uh, there's a paper 
and also an implementation by Cambrian Labs. Thank you.